Hey guys, and welcome to another Nashville Masterclass. I am, as always, Jamie the Handsome, and we're finally going to get to it. Today we're going to do Grey Gardens. It's I've been working on this for a month, and that's a month for months. And mainly that's because I got a new digital camera and already recorded the whole thing and found out it's not compatible with my MacBook, so having to do it all over again. I definitely dedicate this to my friend Jerry Torrey, who we will speak of a lot. Now in this video, I am going to separate fact from fiction and, and rumors and uh, articles that very obviously did not do their homework. You know, they just watched half of the movie, maybe looked at somebody else's article, and that's how you, how you got these weird rumors and just lies, things that aren't even true, are just assumptions. Uh, there is no place else where you're going to get all of this information in one place. Not one book, not an article, not a video, nothing. You know, there's other videos about Grey Gardens, and they're mostly for shock value. You know, just, oh my God, you won't believe this. No, we're going to actually dive deep into everything about this movie, right? We're going to go over uh, Grey Gardens, the building, the house itself. We're going to go over the, all the minor characters. And we're going to take deep dives into four characters. Jerry Torrey, Lois Urban Wright, and Big and Little Edie. Now, if you think that you just want to watch Big and Little Edie and that's, you know, the main people of this film... You are completely wrong. Uh, Jerry and Lois both led extremely amazing lives, um, interacting with some some very famous people and doing amazing things. And I promise you, a bombshell. <laughs> um, the first two that we're going into. So... Let's just talk about, you know, what it means to us. Anybody that knows me, has seen my interview on the Soft White Underbelly, knows what my life was like. Lo you know, being in the army, losing my child and her mother, ending up homeless, getting a million dollars, losing it all, going back to the streets and clawing my... I mean, I spent 10 years out there clawing my way back into society and where I am now, I spent a lot of time in dilapidated houses where usually the breadwinner, but sometimes uh, um, the wife, it, it really depended, someone had died, and the other party just couldn't, you know, go on. They just did not know what to do with themselves, and everything was falling apart. And, you know, that's why watching this movie, it means so much to me. And there's so much about it that parallels my own life. And if you're watching this and are a Grey Gardens fan, I'm sure it's touched you in your own way. So, let's get to the history of Grey Gardens. I, I have to write a lot of notes. There's a, a lot about everything. So, the history of Grey Gardens, the property was bought by Stanhope Phillips in 1895 for the princely sum of $2,500. The house was designed by Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe, who had uh, designed several other houses around the South um, East Hampton area. And in 1901, Stanhope Phillips died, leaving his entire estate to his wife, Margaret. In 1931, Robert C. Hill bought the house, and his wife, Anna Gilman Hill, was the one who imported the Spanish concrete walls that enclosed the garden that gives the property its name, and the gardens were designed by Ruth Bramley. In 1924, Feline Bill bought Grey Gardens as a summer home for his wife, Edith. Um, it was sold in 1979 after uh, Big Idiot died to Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn. And um, when Ben died and Sally became a, a widow, she sold it in February of 2017 uh, for the price of $15.5 million. Now, we're going to go to the minor characters next. And by no means do I mean they don't 
make up Grey Gardens. Every person has an integral part and they are something, the, all these characters are something we all need to know about. Now, let's go to some of the minor characters that make up Grey Gardens. First, we have Felon Bill, who was born in 1881 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, close to where I grew up, in Birmingham. He became a Wall Street attorney. I know his father or grandfather was a judge in Montgomery. They were a big family. Um, he became a Wall Street attorney in New York, and he married Edie Ewing Duvier in 1917. Uh, he separated from Big Edie in 1931 and obtained a legal divorce via telegram from Mexico uh, in 1946. Ten years later, he died in 1956. Now, Tom Logan, we hear about Tom. Tom Logan met B Big Edie while he was working at the Sea Spray Inn in the mid-1950s. Uh, he was known as Tex to his friends and... He was missing missing most of his teeth. And it's probably because he would wrangle he used to wrangle steers and ride bulls at the Madison Square Garden Rodeo. He would often play steel guitar and sing for the two women and he would work around the house cooking and cleaning. But he also was a drinker and on more than one occasion found himself in jail and Big Edie would call Lois to go take her to go bail him out of jail. Uh, Tom was found dead on his cot at Grey Gardens in 1964. Now, Jack Helmuth. We see Jack during the birthday party scene in Grey Gardens. He was a friend of the Edies. Um, he had become recently widowed uh, when you see the film, and he would, you know, go out and run errands for them. Um, let's go on to, there's not much we can find about, um, Jack. Lee Radziwill was, of course, the daughter of Black Jack Bouvier and the sister to Jackie Kennedy Onassis. And she was married to the Prince, Prince Radziwill of Poland. And, uh, Lee, of course, is the one that, uh, brought the Maisels to Grey Gardens in the first place to make the um, film that turned out to be that summer that came out in 2017. Jackie Kennedy Onassis was married to John F. Kennedy up until his assassination, then married Aristotle Onassis. Um, Aristotle himself was a Greek shipping magnet and was the one who paid to fix up Grey Gardens and gave Big Edie a monthly stipend up until her death. Doris Francisca, Francisco, met Lois while Lois was reading her palm, and she was um, the one who helped nurse and take care of Big Edie up until her death. She was a friend of Lois. Um, she lived for quite a, a long time, and while we don't hear much of her, she very much help Big Edie in her last days. Um, some other people are, are Elliot Gould, who of course we know is Big Edie's accompanist, and a boogie-woogie composer of the best style, right? Um, from what we can glean from the movie, he was homosexual and didn't want it, that kind of relationship with Big Edie. Um, I don't want to minimize Albert and David Maisels, but for the sake of this video, um, we're not going to go too deep on them. We're going to know enough about them. If you guys want a video on just them, I'll do a whole video on them. Now, Albert and David Maisels were American documentary filmmakers specializing in cinema verde or direct cinema. Um, they had directed Salesman and Give Me Shelter about the Rolling Stones and the very doomed concert, Altamont. Uh, we see a lot of the Maisels films uh, with other bands like The Grateful Dead. Uh, part um, In a lot of their films, you see where um, 
somebody, I think it was their, the Grateful Dead's manager was like, hey, uh, talking to, um, oh my God, Mick Jagger. Do you know Jerry? And Mick's like, yeah, yeah, I know him. Um, it was a pretty big film, especially the Altamont, and that's why they were starting to become on demand, and they were hired by Lee, of course, to film at Grey Gardens. Now, Albert was born uh, November 26, 1926, in Boston. He served in the Army, in the Army Tank Corps in World War II. He studied psychology at Boston University and taught psychology for three years at Boston University. He died March 5th, 2015. David was born in Boston January 10th, 1931, and he also studied psychology at Boston University, and he also served in the Army during the Korean War. He died unexpectedly um, January 3rd, 1987. It, it just kind of came out of nowhere. Well... So, we're going to go on to the movie itself. So, let's just go ahead and do that. We don't even start over, will we? Okay. In 1972, the Suffolk County Health Commission tried to evict Big and Little Edie, uh, saying the house was uninhabitable. Little Edie and Jerry talked them into giving them 10 days to clean it up. Now, that same year is when Lee Radziwill wanted to make a movie of her youth in the, um, in the East Hamptons. Uh, she hired uh, the Maisel Brothers by the, on the suggestion of her boyfriend, Peter Beard. Now, I didn't put him in the minor characters, and I should have. Peter Beard was a famous photog photographer, friends with Andy Warhol. Um... He was the one who suggested the Maisel Brothers, and we see this footage that was never released in the 2017 movie that summer with Peter Beard narrating. Unfortunately, I think it was a couple of years later, he had dementia, and he had wandered off, and they found him dead in the woods uh, around Montauk. Uh, really sad. Um... The movie Grey Gardens was released in 1975 and is held as one of the best documentary movies of all time. It is taught in cinema schools around the world. Um, it, it went through a resurgence in the, resurgence in the early 2000s when we get the HBO movie with Drew Barrymore and Jessica Lange. We get the on and off Broadway musical with Christine uh, Ebersole. And, of course, then you have The Bills of Grey Gardens, which was released in 2015, I think. And that summer, uh, there's always been interest in the movie. It, it means a lot to so many people. And... You know, there were people that said it was exploitive. There's always going to be naysayers. Uh, Little Edie was very excited about the movie because, of course, she always wanted to be a star and felt she was kept from it by taking care of her mother. Um, in the film, people get a lot of wrong ideas now, were they that way in person all the time? Absolutely, yes. Uh, from everybody that was around them is absolutely how they were. How, however, Edie definitely acted out for the cameras a lot more. And you, what you see is um, Big Edie, you know, always harp. I see it in the comments all the time. She's just harping on being mean. <laughs> what you gotta understand is little Edie is acting out for the camera, making a pain of herself on purpose. And Big Edie really did not want anything to do with the movie so much as just doing it for her daughter. And so that's what we're, we're, we're seeing. And that's what you have to understand about this. You can't, you can take some things on face value, but you can't, 
decide on exactly who people are and their intentions just by a 90 minute, if that much, film. It goes much deeper than that. Now, let's go to the deep dives of Jerry Torrey and Lois Urban Wright. All right. Here we are again with my friend, Jerry Torrey. Let's dive in and see what old Jer is all about. So Jerry Torrey was born in 1955 in the Kensington area of Brooklyn. Um, he first became interested in sculpture at the 1964 World's Fair in Queens, seeing Michelangelo's The Piata at the Vatican Pavilion. Um, during that time, uh, Brooklyn was getting worse and worse as Jerry got older and more violent, so they moved the family up to Holbrook, Long Island. Now, before this, I want to mention that Jerry often had to go to other relatives' house, his grandmother, his uncle, because his father was abusive towards him, uh, his brother, his mother, um, very angry, uh, heavy-handed, and coming from a Sicilian, he's Italian, and I'm Sicilian, same thing, basically. I, can, I did not have, live in that kind of um, atmosphere, but I definitely had relatives that would get mad at a second and didn't hesitate to show it. So this is the kind of atmosphere young Jerry had to grow up in. So they moved the family to um, Holbrook, Long Island, and then they up and moved back to Queens. Um, Jerry was accepted to uh, SUNY State University of New York at an early age. He got early admittance at admission at 16, but his father refused to pay for it, and that's when Jerry started running away. He kept getting picked up and brought back, but he finally got away with the help of an officer, Stephen Holbrook, um, that was a father of one of his friends. So Jerry moves in with them and finishes high school. Um, after graduation, Officer Holbrook uh, gives um, use of a fishing cottage rent-free uh, on the shores of Long Island while Jerry looks for work. So, you know, he goes around looking for a job at these big, huge mansions around um, the East Hamptons. So he finds himself at the estate of the industri industrialist Gerald Geddes and is hired by a woman named Charlotte. Now, <laughs> I had to say that one of the stipulations of this job was Jerry couldn't be seen by Gerald, his family, or any of his company. So whenever he heard the car come up the drive, heard them talking, coming around, he had to dive into the nearest bush to keep from being seen. One day, as he's riding around on his bike around the Hamptons, he's going towards uh, Lily Pond Lane and goes up on, this, on the grass under a tree to take a nap. And he sees the peaks of the roof of Grey Gardens sticking up out of the trees and he rides his bike up there and you know he sees the broken down cadillac the vines you know trying to suffocate gray gardens and he can't really believe what he's seeing he doesn't have the nerve to go and knock on the door he's not even sure if anybody lives there so he goes home and later that night he's tossing and turning in bed he can't get to sleep so he decides to go see, did I really see that this house is bad as I thought? So he goes back, and at night he sees lights on on the second floor. So he knows someone lived there, and he makes up his mind to go knock on the door the next day. So he finishes his chores as fast as he can and goes to Grey Gardens. He goes up to the door and peeks in, and before he can even knock, little Edie comes down the stairs, opens the door, Looks at him and says, Oh my, the gray fawn has arrived. I'm paraphrasing. So, what Jerry was do, did, he offered 
to help clean up, you know, work in the yard because he was a gardener. She said, come back tomorrow and meet mother. So he came back the next day, went in, inside. He said the, the smell hit him, you know, but he didn't want to show, you know, he, he had to be amazed at walking in there. What you see in the movie is not what it was like. Um, we're talking cans of cat food towering over your head, cat feces, generations of cat urine permeating the wood. You know, the, the roof was, parts of it were missing. You could see branches coming in from above. There's raccoons and cats crawling all over the place, but he doesn't want to show, you know, anything on his face what he's looking at because he doesn't want to insult them. So he goes and talks to Big Edie and offers her services. And that's when he begins, you know, helping them out and just trying to do what he can for them. You got to remember, he's run away. He misses his mom and his family, but he can't go back because of his dad. So this has become his family. He finds a, a mother figure in Big Edie. And he was there the entire time. Um... He was, uh, when they started shooting Grey Gardens, David tried to put him at ease by asking him to help out. So he does. One part that didn't get filmed, unfortunately, the uh, Maisel brothers weren't there this day, but Jackie uh, showed up. And in the HBO movie, it's a completely different scene from what actually happened. She comes there. And up until this time, Jerry really didn't understand who the, the Bills were. He knew they came from a prestigious lineage, but he had no idea that the Jackie they had been talking about was Jackie Kennedy. When he was a kid and uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he was at Catholic school and they made him all get on their knees and pray for him. And there he was standing face to face with uh, Jackie Kennedy, and she says, you must be Jerry. It seems like my aunt's taking quite a shine to you. But big, I mean, little Edie will not let her in. She screams out the window, don't you dare let her in. And as she, you know, she talks to little Edie for a little while, while and uh, as she walks away, she tells Jerry, if I'm, I'm going to send some packages soon. Will you make sure they get to my aunt? And he assures her. And that's what he does. Now, there are all, all kinds of um, magazine articles that call him feckless and opportunist. You know, Edie says things of this nature because of the the washing machine. He, he the Gerald Gettys gave him the washing machine, and he was taking it to him just as a favor. Not to seal the deal. And you see this one part where he goes, I know what he wants. They only want one thing. Now, you know, I can understand this. People are all the time saying, look at that handsome guy. I know what he's up to. So I can understand. But the thing is, and to show how much Edie can be wrong, is Jerry's gay. And his boyfriend, Ted would very much disagree with what Edie said. So you got to kind of take the things Edie says with a grain of salt. You know, I'll get into more about this later, but so many people have idolized Edie, and there's no problem with that. I do too. But from somebody who's lost so much, I can tell you that that doesn't happen without affecting your mental well-being. And already there were things about Edie long before this happened. She lost everything. And you got to understand, people get so mad when you talk about Edie's um, mental well-being. But these are the same people that are, you know, put put mental illness, uh, make it, you know, normal. Don't don't make fun of people. Well, so so why should you worry about her? There is definitely things going on with Edie, not saying she's not a good person, not saying she's not sharp as a tack and a wonderful person. I love Edie. But the things about Jerry are just wrong. 
you know, anything but a guy that was trying his damnedest to help these women and find a family in them. So after Grey Gardens, he saw the movie and it, it hurt him, you know, but he was getting older. So he moves out, you know, into New York City itself. He, um, <laughs> he actually becomes Mr. Club Baths. In 1977, he uh, starts learning uh, about bartending. Um, in Provincetown, Massachusetts, he met Waylon Flowers and Madam before they got their own show in on Hollywood Squares. Um, he had um, a relationship with Waylon Flowers, uh, but Waylon invited Jerry to go out to Hollywood with them. I mean, Jerry was one of the only other people that could hold Madam. And from Jerry, we find out there's a Madam you saw on TV and a BDSM of Madam clad in leather. <laughs> but Jerry, that's not the life Jerry wants. He already found out from Gary Gardens he, that's just not what he wants. Um, he moves back down to New York. Unfortunately, in 1988, we, Wayland succumbed to um, AIDS. So, it, you got to understand, during the late 70s and early 80s, before then, um, the gay community was ostracized and indeed could be locked up in jail or locked up in a mental institution just for being openly gay. And now, they can be who they are. So, there's a lot of partying going on, but of course, partying comes at a price. Now, um... That's my dogs. He better stop. Anyway, so after going back to New York, he um, gets a job, and of all places, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, working for the royal family at their palace. Can you imagine that? That's amazing. So he's making a lot of money. I think upwards of seventy, eighty thousand dollars. If I remember correct, I'm not making it up in my mind. So he's sending this money back to his partner, Robert, who is investing it for him. So when he comes back, they start um, their own moving business uh, called AAA All uh, Borough Trucking. And the reason for AAA is it would become first in the phone book. Very smart. They start uh, moving high-end art pieces for high-end uh, clients, like Palamo Picasso, daughter of Pablo. Um, so, you know, they're making good money. Jerry's still partying a, a, a lot, and he starts to hear whispers of healthy gay, healthy young gay men uh, dying in San Francisco of some cancer. And then it hits New York, and then it's happening all over the place, and his friends are dying. And uh, one day in 1987, Robert, his partner, gets sick, starts talking nonsense, and they were in walking distance to uh, the Lenox Hill Hospital, where Robert was diagnosed with AIDS, and he died a few months later. So Jerry goes home and starts the awful, awful spiral into addiction. The spiral I know all too well. He said when he got home from the funeral, he tried to call um, some men to come over and help party with them. And he said to the men, every one of them had died. So Jerry starts losing everything as addicts do. You know, I lost million, uh, well over a million dollars. Uh, it didn't all go to drugs, but I did not know how to handle money like that. You know, you get somebody who's an homeless addict, that kind of money, and don't, don't help, don't give them a, um, a, uh, well, I know the name. I'm going to put it on the screen later. I have ADHD. Words escape me. I didn't have anybody to help me with this kind of money. And as an addict, he's losing everything he's built. Now, on, um, July 4th, 1992, Jerry's walked around South Sea Seaport, and he starts feeling dope sick. So he goes home to do his drugs. The drugs aren't helping. 
they're not making him well. He starts dry heaving uncontrollably. And he doesn't have a telephone for all you kids out there. Back then, you didn't have cell phones. You had one landline, and Jerry hadn't had it paid for a while, so it was turned off. So he makes his way outside and collapses in the street, and someone calls an ambulance, and he wakes up at Cabrini Hospital. And he is diagnosed with several abscesses, severe dehydration, um, blockage in his left arm, and HIV positive. Now, a while ago, that could be devastating news, but he's just happy to be alive and not to have full-blown AIDS. When he leaves Cabrini, he um, checks into Smithers Rehabilitation Center for a 30-day inpatient. Then when he leaves there, he enrolls in an outpatient program, not, not going back to his apartment. When you're an addict and you get clean, you cannot go back to the environment that you were in while you were using be around those people and ever expect to stay clean. It doesn't work like that. So he sleeps on, you know, people's couches and he gets a job uh, part-time as a taxi driver. Uh, he gets a job from one of his friends, I'm assuming an AA, and eventually gets his own apartment with a garden in the back. Now, in 2005, um, Jerry... Hold on, let me go back real quick and just say, Jerry was at Big Edie's funeral. And in the movie, we see her singing her recording, her and Gould's recording of We Belong Together. And as a request before she died, she requests that song be played. Jackie was there, Lee was there, the Maisels were there, even though Edie wouldn't let the Maisels in. But the record record players there and the record was there. And when the funeral began, Jerry played We Belong Together. I just thought of that and I wanted to put that in there. That was the last time he talked to Big Edie. I mean, Little Edie. But I saw her again years later in front of a hotel as he was driving a taxi. In November 2005, he picks up a young lady and they were talking film and... He divulges that he was Jerry in Grey Gardens. And she turned out to be a friend of Albert Maisel's and said, he's been looking for you for years. You need to call the Maisel's Institute tomorrow. So he calls. He talks to Albert. They reunite. Um, you know, she, he finds out David had died when he talks to the young lady. But he's happy to see Albert. Now, um... A few days later, they go to the Peter B. Lewis uh, Theater at the Guggenheim, where they um, watch a reading of the musical Grey Gardens, and he meets Christine Ebersol and Matt Cavanaugh, who plays Jerry in the musical. Um, they go back to May the Maisel's Institute. He gets to see uh, the bills of Grey Gardens. He says, like, you know, going back in a time machine and getting to see all these people over again, but there's kind of a numbness, you know, because he's been so, so long separated from that life. But I know on a Sunday afternoon, not long after, they took a ride to Grey Gardens, and Jerry was able to go inside and see how it was. And everything had changed. Everything had changed. The back porch was gone. There was no more sea of leaves. There was a pool. However... The most important room, the center room, where you see Big and Little Edie, they had their beds, was still there with two beds in it. And Jerry, of course, is still alive and well today, living in New York with his boyfriend, Ted. And he is sculpting, just like the marble fawn he is. All right, next we're going to go to Lois. Alright guys, welcome back. We're going to go on to Lois and just like Jerry, this is a deep dive and this is where I promise you the bombshell. Right. Uh, you don't see much of Lois in the film, but I promise you she makes up a huge part of the history of Grey Gardens. So Lois Urban Wright was born July 9th, 1928 in New York City. Nine months before an Andy Warhol had come kicking and screaming and calling things derivative into this world. Now, um, she was 
She was born to parents Catherine and William Clark Wright. She had an older brother, Bill, who was six years her elder. And Bill is an interesting character. He was a pilot and also the only person in the world to interview the artist Jackson Pollock, who they lived close by. He was the only one who recorded had a recording of Jackson Pollock. And in the um, bio, biopic Pollock, there, um, there's a person who plays uh, her brother Bill in the movie. Uh, her father, William, was a piano salesman. At, he once performed at Carnegie Hall. Young Lois, she was a bit of a tomboy. She loved to ride horses, and she loved to, you know, play uh, rough house with her older brother and his friends. Um, at the age of 12, Lois decided she had had enough of public school back then. You didn't have a computer with a database. All she did was stay inside until 3 o'clock so she wouldn't be caught by the ever-frightful truant officer. Now, um, as a young lady, no, Lois never went back. She stayed on. <laughs> as a young lady, Lois became interested in palm reading. In 1956, her father, William, uh, had complained of a sudden backache and died later that day. It, it really devastated Lois. Now, he was a nice man. He really loved his family. One of the things he did when he got upset, he would hop in his car and drive off to Mississippi, where he was from, for a few days and then come back happy. Remember that because it's going to come into play later on. Now, Lois started reading poems at the Sea Spray Inn. Um, she read uh, she read Baby Davis's um, poem, and it was around 1947 she met uh, she met her Lois and her mother Catherine met Big and Little Edie at the Sea Spray Inn. And, you know, over the years. Uh, Lois was always with them. She would go there whenever she was needed. Well, when Tom Logan died, Lois was the one that was called. Um, when uh, JFK was inaugurated, this isn't in the movie or anywhere else, Little Edie actually went to um, the inauguration of JFK, and it was Lois who stayed with Big Edie and took care of her. Now... Over the years, she would uh, read more Illuminaries poems like Christine uh, Brinkley, Billy Joel, Barbara Mandrell, and Frank Sinatra. Um, many years later, at another establishment, I think Gurney, she actually met Willie Nelson, and she was wearing one of those bandanas around her head, and she mentioned they both looked alike with the bandanas and said that Willie was really you know, down to earth, a really nice man. Um, got ahead of myself. Now, Lois was there for, you know, since the 47, the early 50s. So she was able to watch, she saw Grey Gardens in its glory and watched over time as it went from a mansion to an antediluvian nightmare, right? Um... She had many suitors. Uh, she was a very pretty young lady, but she wasn't very interested in, in man. She had one love of her life. Uh, she never, she didn't marry him. She didn't, wasn't in a relationship with him, but she kept a picture of him on her nightstand uh, from what I understand the rest of her life. Now, I gotta move my notes up. Now, I was not able to, you know, capture the, uh, capture, get the name of the one she was in love with. She never mentions that. Uh, she did reluctantly um, marry uh, Eugene Tr Trigger in March 30th of 1971. Pretty much out of the fear of growing old by herself. Um, it was early in the fall of 1971 uh, her mother had been getting ill. She was riding around in a, a wheelchair, and it was actually that wheelchair that Big Edie 
eventually started using herself as her health started failing her. But in the fall of 1971, the year she got married, she um, went out to the... Um, Southampton Hospital uh, to her mother's room just to find it empty. No one had called, no one had sent a letter. She had passed away. Now, this is really, really hurt Lois. And one thing you do, you don't hear in Grey Gardens, but in the, the bills of Grey Gardens, Lois was a member of AA. She drank a lot and, you know... This would definitely hurt her sobriety, make her want to drink more. Um, now, it was an early fall of, uh, it says 71 in Lois's book. I saw 72 in other places. We're so, you know, we're, I'm not going to fight on this. But it was then that the, the county, uh, the Suffolk County Board of Health, you know, came to Ray. That's when... Lee Radzewell came with the Mazels and Peter Peter Beard. Now, Lois stayed out of it. And this is where the bombshell comes in. Because of a rumor, she didn't want to come face-to-face -face with Jackie and Lee. Uh, she talked to the ladies a few times on the phone and did see them, but she, she didn't want to be, see them face-to-face -to -face because of the consequences. And... Indeed, during the filming of Grey Gardens, she wrote a letter to the Maisels asking them to, you know, cut out a lot of her scenes, and they did up until the bills of Grey Gardens. Now, Big Edie knew. She would say things like, I can't get over how much you and Jackie resemble each other. You two are the spitting image of each other when you were young, she would say with a slight smile. The rumor fit perfectly. Lois was born a year before Jacqueline and two days after Jackie's parents were married. Lois was conceived nine months exactly before the wedding of Jackie and Lee's parents. The rumor goes... Oh, and before I even say that, let's put up some pictures of Jackie and Lee and Lois when they were young. See the resemblance? The rumor goes that when, uh, during one of William's excursions off to Mississippi, her mother Catherine, Catherine had an affair, one night stand, with Black Jack Bouvier. And I want to stress the fact that if Lois was looking for fame or money, she could have easily said something. In the movie Grey Gardens, to Jackie herself, if that's what she was looking for, but she never said anything till years later in her book, Ghost of Grey Gardens. So let's not try to say that she was just doing it for this reason or that, because she never said anything to years later. Years. I think even Lee had died at this point. So Lois. You know, she moved into uh, Grey Gardens. Uh, I think they have been done filming Grey Gardens. Uh, she moved out a little bit before um, Biggie died, and her friend Doris came to help. Um, I promised you a bombshell, and pow. So anyway, um, after little Evie sold Grey Gardens, she, Lois stayed in the Hamptons. Uh, she went to upstate for a little while to live with her brother Bill's family. She started reading Palms at Gurney, where she met Willie Nelson and all the, you know, most of the stars of the 80s. At the beginning of 1987, Lois began filming her own TV show at LTV, which is a public access uh, TV station in the Hamptons. Uh, she is the longest, longest running show on LTV history. Uh, filming her last show in 2018. In 2006, Michael Suxy and Drew Marymore stopped by Lois's house to talk about Grey Gardens. Now, Michael had gotten a manuscript about Lois's life and offered her a huge sum of $100 for it, which she refused. 
And due to her refusal, she was once again, you know, taken out of Grey Gardens. The only nod she got was when Big Edie, at the end of the movie, hands Little Edie a little yellow box. Like the one that Lois gave Big Edie during the birthday scene of Grey Gardens. Now, Lois is still alive today. Lois is 94 years old this year. And her and Jerry are the only ones still alive from Grey Gardens. And as you can see, these characters make up a huge deal of what Grey Gardens is. They each have led a very complex and amazing life, and that's another reason I identify a lot with them. There are, are, I mean, if you want to know about me, you can go right here on YouTube, The Soft White Underbelly, watch my interview, and you'll understand why I've led an amazing life, a very sad life. I've had to live through a lot of horrific and very difficult things, but I've also been a part of a lot of amazing things and met a lot of famous people and a lot of great people, you know, Jerry being one of my friends. And, you know, that's what make, means so much to me. So next, I'm not sure if I got to do a part one or part two, or if I can do it all at once, but next we're going to go on to Big and Little Edie. Thank you for stopping by and joining me so far.